It's time to talk about June's Journey, a hidden object mystery game with a captivating detective story. When you're playing, you solve a mind-teasing mystery of the roaring 1920s while you dive into June's captivating quest to uncover a scandalous family secret and solve her sister's murder. It's mystery, it's danger, and it's romance, and you never know where the next chapter's gonna take you. If that wasn't fun enough, you get to customize your very own luxurious island estate. Seriously, I cannot stop playing. I am already on the third chapter, and I just started recently. Join me back in time in the glamorous 1920s. June needs your help, detective. Download June's Journey for free today on iOS and Android. Join all the listeners who are listening right now ad-free by clicking subscribe on Apple Podcast, going to patreon.com slash the Murder Diaries pod, or in Spotify, search the Murder Diaries ad-free. Welcome back to another episode of the Murder Diaries podcast. I'm Paige. And I'm Natalie. She was so young, just 20 years old. In her short life, she had already battled addiction and family tragedy. But her optimistic spirit was looking ahead to a brighter future. Just five days after her birthday, she was seen getting into a burgundy pickup truck right before midnight. She's never been seen again. Her name is Amber Gabosh, and this is her story. You still think it's in my head, but I'm walking with the dead. Amber Rose Marie Gabosh was born November 5th, 1990, in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. She was a proud member of the Sapotoweak Cree Nation. Sapotoweak means golden eagle. Winnipeg is where the Red and Assiniboine Rivers meet. It's 60 miles north of the U.S. state of Minnesota. Named after nearby Lake Winnipeg, it's the economic and cultural hub of Manitoba and the heart of the most populated area of central Canada. Winnipeg means murky waters in Cree. It has a metropolitan population of more than 800,000 people. Although it's considered to have a good quality of life, many consider it to be the most unsafe city in Canada. Back to Amber, who was from Winnipeg. Even as a young child, Amber's presence was infectious. Her sister Ashley told Canadian Broadcasting Corp's documentary series Taken that, quote, sometimes she would light up a room and sometimes she wouldn't. She'd walk in and make the room go nuts. Most of the time, she always lit up the room. She was always happy-go-lucky. Amber was very close with her older brother Kyle and sister Ashley. Kyle remembers how mischievous his youngest sister was. They joke and laugh and tease each other a lot. Amber and Ashley, only three years apart, were inseparable growing up. They had a lot of fun together, playing with their Barbie dolls and riding bikes. They loved a good prank, especially popping balloons during family celebrations. Ashley remembers that when there were birthday parties, they used to run around and take a knife and pop every single one of the balloons while their mom was sleeping. They would hide and wait for their mom to start yelling. Quote, we used to make her so mad and we would giggle about it for days. Amber's family nicknamed her Stilts because she was such a tall and skinny kid and the name stuck. Amber was a feisty child with a strong voice. She had a lot of life in her and was very social and outgoing. She was headstrong and wanted to do what she wanted to do. Tragically, when Amber was only nine years old, her oldest sister, Crystal, overdosed at just 19. A week later, Amber's mom, Linda, who had struggled with her own addiction problems, jumped to her death off the Redwood Bridge. She was only 40. A few days later, the mother and daughter, Crystal's mom and sister, were laid to rest together. Amber had always been very close to her mom, and she took the loss very hard. Ashley said she thinks Amber was scarred by her mom's suicide because she never got the chance to say goodbye and felt left behind by her. At the young age of 16, Amber's brother Kyle assumed the huge responsibility of taking care of the family. Ashley said he did the best he could, especially considering his young age. Kyle wanted to protect his sisters and make sure no one harmed them. The small family moved to Swan River, a little town over five hours northeast of Winnipeg. It's a very small town located between the Duck Mountains and the Porcupine Hills. Except for being the hometown of a few professional hockey players, it's pretty unremarkable. 
Ashley and Kyle did not stay in Swan River for very long and eventually moved away, leaving Amber behind. Amber was still too young to go with them, and they became separated. It was years before she would be reunited with her siblings. Ashley said Amber was upset about being left behind. She begged and begged Ashley to take her with her, but Ashley, still very young herself, couldn't take that on. It's unclear who Amber lived with during this time period, but it's known that she had a different father than Crystal, Kyle, and Ashley. So it's possible she lived with her father or another family member of his family, whomever she was living with. It's known that she ran away from home multiple times as a teenager, but she stopped that behavior as she got older. Amber and Ashley eventually reunited in Winnipeg when Amber was a teenager. Ashley said, quote, she ended up coming out here to a program, and then she left the program, and then she was staying in group homes and stuff. That program Ashley is referring to is a rehab that Amber attended in an effort to get clean due to her substance use disorder. She struggled with pills and alcohol, but had dreams of one day becoming a nurse or possibly even a doctor. Amber spent the evening of November 10th, 2010 at her uncle's house, hanging out with family and drinking, according to Ashley. It was just five days after Amber had celebrated her 20th birthday. Amber left her uncle's house to go see her friend, Roxy. After staying an unknown amount of time, Amber left Roxy's house on Bushnell Street and walked to hail a cab back north to her boyfriend's house on College Avenue. But she never arrived. Roxy said she's the best friend I've ever had. I love her so much. For Roxy, Amber's disappearance is doubly heartbreaking. On her leg, she has a tattoo with Amber's name alongside her late cousin Fanasa's name. Fanasa was a sexually exploited youth who also went missing and was last seen getting into a green two-door truck on Aiken Street in August 2007. Tragically, Fanasa had been murdered and her body was found three weeks later. Amber was last seen wearing a white Adidas hoodie with gold stripes on the sleeves, skinny jeans, and white and pink skater-style tennis shoes. At the time of her disappearance, she was 5'4 and 108 pounds with brown hair and hazel eyes. She wore her hair pretty long, and she had a slim build with a light complexion. Based on an eyewitness account, Amber was last seen getting into a 1990s darker red or burgundy Chevy Silverado truck. The truck had an extended cab and a short box with a decal reading 4x4 toward the rear of the box and the outline of the brand name Chevrolet across the tailgate. The driver was described by that eyewitness as a white male believed to be in his 30s and possibly Irish. He was wearing a faded camouflage baseball hat. The man may have been wearing prescription eyeglasses, have hairier arms, light red or blonde stubble on his face, and reddish hair. A police sketch of the driver was created and distributed throughout the surrounding community. When speaking about where Amber was last seen at the corner of William Avenue and Isabel Street, her brother Kyle said, I don't know what she was doing there. It's not a very good spot for girls. The questions in this case do remain. Did Amber know the driver? Was she accepting a ride from the stranger to get from point A to point B? Was she in an active sex work situation? Sadly, the truth really may never be known. When Amber went missing, Ashley was in rehab. Her cousin had been frantically trying to reach Ashley, calling and texting. It took a while, but finally her cousin let her know that Amber hadn't been heard from in a few days. Ashley was devastated. She said that her whole body went numb and she just stared at the floor for weeks. Amber's brother Kyle became more worried as the days went by since Amber had last been heard from. It was especially concerning because Amber was so young and loved to meet new people. When she got out of rehab, Ashley tried to file a police report, but she said it wasn't taken seriously. Police mostly ignored her. Eventually, Kyle made another report that officials seemed to take more seriously. Ashley says of this time that they were praying for the best, but preparing for the worst. Kyle said a big reason that police were indifferent to Amber's disappearance was because that she had been involved in sex work. Once that fact was revealed, Kyle said it was clear that authorities stopped caring as much. Ashley said, quote, they did say she possibly could have ran away. She was out partying. She would usually party for about five days. That was their excuse. Okay, so four years later, is she still out partying? Is she still having a good time? Like, that's where I'm at, end quote. 
This episode was made possible in part by Thrive Market. One thing that everybody has to do is eat, and that involves grocery shopping. So why not do it from the comfort of your own bed or couch or wherever you are? This is where Thrive Market comes in. They sell nutrient-dense products, and trust me, everyone can find something they love. Thrive Market is quickly becoming my go-to for all of my groceries and household essentials. Seriously, the convenience of getting everything online and then quickly shipped straight to my doorstep is such a time saver. I love that Thrive Market carries brands with the highest quality ingredients and sourcing methods. They restrict hundreds of ingredients across their food and cleaning categories. And I can use their on-site filters to suit my lifestyle needs. Whether you're looking for organic kid snacks, low sugar alternatives, or gluten-free pantry essentials like me and Paige, you can curate your own shopping experience with a few clicks that make simpler, healthier swaps. It's so easy to use their filters to find what you need too. Natalie and I tend to eat gluten-free and it's so easy to use their filter to find gluten-free options. It does all the work for us. It really does. Not only do I save time shopping as a Thrive Market member, but I also save money on every single order. On average, I save over 30% every time. They even have a deals page that changes daily and always has some of my favorite products. One of my favorite brands that Thrive carries is Molly Suds. It's a non-toxic household cleaning brand and I love it. I use it all the time. I used it before Thrive and it just is so much more convenient to order it with everything else that I'm getting to stock my pantry. And let's not forget when you join Thrive Market, you're also helping a family in need with their one-for-one membership matching program. You join and they give. We love to see it. Save time and money by shopping on Thrive Market today. Go to thrivemarket.com slash diaries for 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash diaries. Thrivemarket.com slash diaries. Kyle says that this is what he thinks happened. They didn't go knocking on anyone's door. Really. All the information they got was from what my family and I gave them. Investigators from the missing persons unit took a cell phone that Amber had used but wasn't carrying at the time of her disappearance. They said they had no reason to believe Amber was in danger but are concerned since her complete lack of contact is, quote, very much out of character. Kyle and his family, along with help from other friends and other supporters, covered the area in flyers about Amber's disappearance. They plastered every telephone pole up and down main roads like Portage and Main Street in Winnipeg. They also handed out flyers to anyone they came across who was going out of town so they could spread the word beyond Winnipeg. No matter the weather, Amber's supporters were out there putting up flyers. Kyle remembers for Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, we were doing that for the longest time. At the time of his interview, Kyle said police hadn't been in touch with his family much about Amber's case. Their last update was that her name was spray-painted on a wall in the Toronto area, but they couldn't say exactly where or why. When asked what he thinks happened to her, Kyle said, Someone she knows. I had a big speech with her a couple weeks before about how you can't trust nobody. Nobody. Don't trust nobody. Tragically, Amber isn't the first person in her family to disappear. In June of 2003, her cousin Sylvia, a 20-year-old mother with another one on the way, vanished from her apartment in Swan River. She has never been found. A monument honoring Manitoba's missing and murdered Indigenous women was unveiled in August 2014 in Winnipeg. It's where Amber's family and other families of missing and murdered Indigenous women go to remember their loved ones. Kyle said of the monument, it's like a headstone for a lot of us. My sister has been missing for six years. We can't give her a burial or nothing. She's not even pronounced dead, so that's where we go. In the wake of Amber's disappearance, Kyle co-founded a movement called Drag the Red that allows family to search the Red River, which is one of Winnipeg's major rivers, for their missing loved ones. The Red River for centuries has been a major waterway for Indigenous people to travel for hunting and fishing, ceremony and feasting. The prairie territory surrounding it was once teeming with huge herds of buffalo. The case that inspired the Drag the Red movement was the discovery of 15-year-old Tina Fontaine's remains that were found wrapped in a bag in 2014. Kyle helped form the group that searches the river by motorboat, canoe, and along the shore for missing people. Drag the Red volunteers want to try and bring closure to as many families as possible. Kyle eventually quit his job to devote himself to Drag the Red full-time. In 2014 alone, seven bodies were found by Drag the Red. 
co-founder Bernadette Smith said Kyle was the one who, when I put it on social media, said, let's do it. The police aren't going to do it. Let's just do it. Had he not said that, we probably wouldn't have been here 13 years later dragging this river, helping to give families hope and bringing communities together. The work is also personal for Bernadette. Her sister Claudette was a 21-year-old mother of four when she vanished. She was last seen at Winnipeg's Lincoln Motor Hotel. When her sister went missing, Bernadette said a busload of volunteers gathered to search for her because police didn't seem to be doing enough. Years later, Bernadette is still searching for answers. Getting out on the river gives many a sense of purpose and community. It shows that the lives of the missing and murdered Aboriginal women have meaning. Bernadette also says it's very empowering to be doing this kind of work. It's getting people up off the couch to say, I can make a difference. Every time Kyle's hook hit a snag when they were dragging the river, his heart would leap into his throat. As much as he wanted to bring closure to grieving families, Kyle said, your mind starts going all over the place. I pray that I don't find her in there. Drag the Red wants Winnipeg police to do more than just monitor the volunteers from a boat and actually join the search. So far, police have declined, saying only that they will support the group from a, quote, safety standpoint. A 2016 Canadian documentary called The River chronicles the work of Drag the Red. Sadly, Kyle, who once said in an interview for a docuseries about searching for Amber, can't stop, won't stop, suddenly passed away in September of 2021. He was only 38 years old. Surviving Kyle are his four children and his legacy as a champion for the missing with the Drag the Red movement. His 18-year-old daughter, Kyra, is now continuing his work searching for remains on the river. Kyra said, he did it because people weren't looking for them or stopped and he wanted to find them. Because if they're not looking, who's looking? I want to carry that on. Even though he was going through pain missing Amber, he kept looking for her and looking for the other families. I want to keep doing that under his name. Across Canada, missing and murdered Indigenous women are making headlines and their families are accusing police of not doing enough. It's not just a problem. It's become a national epidemic. Drag the Red has taken it upon themselves to do what could be considered police work. They don't receive any governmental funding and law enforcement refuses to help them, insisting the river is too dangerous for dive teams. Since 1980, more than 1,200 Indigenous women have been murdered or reported missing in Canada. A report on the crisis was released announcing the number of unsolved cases had now been reduced from 225 to 204. But in the years since their last update, 11 more Indigenous women disappeared, and 32 more were killed. It's clearly a serious problem. The statistics about missing and murdered Indigenous women are stark and staggering. A 2015 United Nations report found that young Aboriginal women are five times more likely to die under violent circumstances as compared with their non-Aboriginal counterparts. Five times! Let that sink in. It's also been reported that Indigenous women report rates of violence 3.5 times higher than non-Aboriginal women. Two weeks before Christmas in 2014, Amber's father suffered a massive heart attack and died without ever finding out what happened to his daughter. Five years after her disappearance, Amber's family and friends held a vigil to renew calls for justice in her case. Her sister Ashley remained steadfast in her mission to find her. She's quoted as saying, This is our first vigil, but it won't be our last. We'll never quit until she's found. Ashley said the purpose of the vigil was to bring her sister's case back into the spotlight and hopefully influence people in the community to do more to help give the family closure. Ashley said, I'm here today to get answers to where she is, to raise awareness that she's still gone and she's still missed and that we really love her. Detective Sergeant Aiken and police are still hoping to bring closure to the family. Aitken says, we realize this has been a long time. We're hopeful that this will bring us further along in the investigation. We understand how difficult this would be, not only for this family who's dealing with this and has had no information as to the whereabouts of their loved one, but really to their community. There are a lot of people who have invested a lot of time and effort in trying to locate this individual. In 2016, Amber's case was taken on by Project Devote. Project Devote is a joint task force between the Winnipeg Police Department and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, better known as the RCMP. It was created in 2012 and at first focused on 28 cases dating all the way back to 1961. 
Since Project Devote began, one case has been resolved. Ashley says, my family has a lot of faith in Project Devote. They made it clear they only want to bring closure, and I truly believe them. Ashley hopes Project Devote taking a fresh look at her sister's case might generate new leads. Project Devote has 18 officers, 10 from the Winnipeg police and 8 from the RCMP. Sergeant Pike, a Winnipeg police officer on Project Devote, said, Every day can be different. At certain times, we dig in the files looking for a break. One day, we may get a call from someone that causes us to act. We follow every tip we can to the nth degree. And remembering her sister, Ashley says she deserves to be found. She deserves a voice. We are her voice right now, and it's really hard to do this. Ashley added that regardless of the circumstances that led to her sister's disappearance, the family just wants closure on what happened. Ashley pleads with the public, if this was an accident, just come forward. We deserve answers. If you have any information on the disappearance of Amber Rose Marie Gabosh or the truck or its driver, please call Manitoba Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-8477. You can also submit a secure tip online at manitobacrimestoppers.com or you can text tipman plus your message to crimes. That's 274-637. Be sure to check us out at the Murder Diaries pod on all social media. And until next week, stay safe. Bye. Bye. Seeking the truth never gets old. Introducing June's Journey, the free-to-play mobile game that will immerse you in a thrilling murder mystery. Join June Parker as she uncovers hidden objects and clues to solve her sister's death in a beautifully illustrated world set in the roaring 20s. With new chapters added every week, the excitement never ends. Download June's Journey now on your Android or iOS device or play on PC through Facebook games.